Stanford University. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first uh, week of E380 uh, Fall 2008-2009. Uh, E380, as m many of you know, is uh, perhaps the best lecture series at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not bragging about it because I'm involved with it, because all I do is show up and invite speakers. Dennis Allison, who's currently in Montana, finds these wonderful people. But because it's one hour a week, you get world somebody who's world class every single week. And how much work do you have to do? You have to write a short little comment on it. You can, you can view the, the lectures at home or wherever you happen to be because it's uh, webcast and uh, stored or in podcast and iTunes and all the other things. Um, and how many things are you going to remember out of compilers? LALR can't handle shift reduce unless you do certain sort of look ahead. Yeah, you're going to use that. Um, I guarantee there will be two or three things this quarter that you'll use more than, th that will come in very handy sometime in your life. And I don't think you can say that about classes you spend three, three to five hours a week on. Uh, not that they're not fine classes. Um, website. Uh, we380.stanford.edu. There's schedules, there's forms for assignments, uh, and there will be an evaluation um, for the class. Of course, an FAQ, mailing list for announcements, and online archived versions of the talks. And it's really worth sometimes going back to old talks because there are themes that run throughout um, many themes. Uh, better than your average soap opera. We're running at least six themes uh, and over a longer period than lost. Um, open lecture, live, and it's really best to be here because often really interesting things happen after the cameras go off, um, especially when the MBAs decide it's interesting and start sort of swamping the building, uh, <laughs> which is sort of interesting because speakers from not Stanford 
don't understand Stanford. And so they come here and they say, I'm going to give a talk, and they give a talk, and people come down and try and start companies with them. <laughs> and they think this is odd behavior. Um, basically, anything that's involved with a computer is a subject for us. Uh, we presume that your master's or PhD level. Uh, there's not any hand-holding. Um, sorry. Um, if you're registered for units, please, uh, all 10 lectures, and don't try and do them at the last moment. You, you really lose something. You want that, that writing of that one, that couple of sentences of notes just to get, get the important thing into your mind that's going to pop out in three years, and you're going to say, ah, I know how to do this, or I know, or I know who to talk to. Um, okay, and we've sort of flipped through all this. Pass no credit. Um, you can keep enrolling in it again and again and again, and we're not all that lenient about accepting lates um, because most people who try and do lates don't ever finish. And so, eh, we don't care. Um, ma mailing addresses, of course, are on the website. Um, next week, continuing this week's theme, will be Richard Kaufman from HP's High Performance Computing. He'll talk about blade computers, their interconnect, and their sort of view of the world. Um, back, to our, back to our biz school friends, uh, on October 8th, Ted Selker of MIT Media Lab is going to come and talk about new, some, some possible new ways of doing biz development for technology companies. Um, October 15th, we've rearranged the world a bit. Uh, Jane McGonigal will be here. We're going to talk about, sh she is going to talk about a game on a vastly, well, it's not the biggest game, but it's going to be perhaps one of the more intense big games, um, which moved Guido Rossum back. Uh, yeah, we moved Google people around. <laughs> okay. Um, today's speaker, Jonathan Pavu, um, I said we, one of the threads that runs through, it's computer science, you think that, well, Moore's Law is one of our threads. Well, Moore's Law is actually for wimps. Um, it turns out if you look at a lot of the, the trends we're dealing with, they're bigger, they're faster than Moore's Law. Moore's Law is an underestimate. And one of the places where Moore's Law is an underestimate, a lower bound, is the amount of computation that is available to a person or to an organization. Um, not only does the processing capability of individual systems double fairly regularly, the cost goes down. People buy, buy sort of at a constant cost unless they're growing, and then they're buying at a growing cost. So organizations are building more data centers each year, which is sort of an interesting co concept, because the data center internally is growing, capability is growing faster than Moore's Law, and they're growing their data centers faster than Moore's Law. Um, this is, can't go on, but it's an interesting ride while we're on it. Um, Jonathan Pavu, to today's speaker, is speaking on um, how he's looking at the problem. And he's got a very interesting perspective because he's at IBM. And IBM, you get to do things from further down the uh, food chain. You, they, don't just build building, they don't just build and specify boards and not buy Intel parts when they don't like them. They can actually fab their own. Uh, and they own operating systems. So with that. Thank you very much. So it's um, certainly an honor to be here. But I really hope today we can share with you some of the fun and excitement we've had working on Project Kitty Hawk. Uh, the, there's just been something really cool about being able to create personal environments composed of thousands of processors, general purpose processors, and just a few keystrokes. Uh, Project Kitty Hawk itself is joint work with my colleagues, Okmar Ulig, who's here today, and Amos Waterland and Brian Rosenberg at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York. Now, in 2006, we started discussing this idea about uh, treating computation as a commodity for trade. And in, 2000, in 2007, we started uh, Project Kitty Hawk to explore the viability of a global scale public computer. In many ways, similar in spirit to the kind of systems that McCarthy and Licklider envisioned in the 1960s. 
And to be honest, many of these things that we talk about today, it's really worthwhile paying attention to what some of our pioneers had said, and we'll come back to that later at the end of the talk. Now, our approach, it, it's sort of simple. First, we want to work, our goal is to advance the viability of a widely accessible, scalable computer that represents a significant fraction of the world's current global computational capacity. And our approach, we want to take global computation and combine it with a massive parallel processor. Now, arguably, the, uh, the most pervasive model of global computation we have today is the internet. Now, although this is not our only target, it really seems that if we're going to work towards a general purpose system, we should at least be able to support the properties that would allow us to have internet style computation as an application on our system. Now abstractly, what we want to do is we want to be able to map internet computation onto our massive parallel processor as, as one of our uh, modes of computation. Now, massive parallel processors are predominantly supercomputers today and predominantly designed for scientific and high performance uh, computing. That being said, our experience with the IBM Blue Gene P system has really indicated that it really might not be a bad place to start for general purpose systems when you really want to think about scale. Blue Gene gives us an idea of what is achievable with large scale integration and with today's technology. BlueGene P's, which is the uh, current uh, model of the BlueGene product line, has a theoretical limit of 16.7 million fully connected nodes, where a single node is a quad core general purpose processor with RAM and all the I.O. subsystems such you can form seamless fabrics of communication that span the entire system. So every node can communicate with every other node. Now, this is not a configuration that you can go today and order from IBM. <laughs> if you are going to do that, actually, I think all of us in the project would be very curious to hear from you. But that being said, the, the architecture itself has no inherent limit to reaching that scale. But the uh, building, engineering, and the redesign of the cooling needed to get there is outside the product line scope. Now, to put that scale into perspective a little bit, Consider that in 2006, the population of New York was about 8.2 million. So that would mean about two nodes per capita, or approximately uh, eight cores for every New Yorker. Um, and that's the New York City proper, not the larger New York. Um, now, another way to think about that is that in 2005, the total number of US volume servers installed were about 9.9 .9 million. And that's going to translate in a ratio to our machine of about 1.6 nodes for every volume server installed in the US. So that's about six cores. Okay, so if a machine like BlueGene is our target, and now our job is then, is how are we going to capture the internet style computation and support it? Now, the internet is predominantly really composed of topologies of interconnected intranets where the interior networks of an intranet organize and protect the machines and resources of an organization. And then these intranets are connected through well-known points, gateways and firewalls to form the internet. Now, a machine like BlueGene and a supercomputer in general, from a communications perspective, is typified by a uniform, scalable interconnect fabric. And our job then is to figure out how are we going to be able to map those kind of properties onto those kind of uh, networks. Now, our abstract view, because it's sort of helpful to set this in context, of course on the right is our big, big computer, and on the left are some users, and we have a public access network. And our users are going to be able to access the system through a service interface that's on the public access network, to create environments out of the raw hardware resources of this machine. Now, of course, users here, I really want you to think about it in that larger sense of the word user, so that recursive sense, where in many ways, 
the end users will likely not even be aware of the system. Rather, they will be using services provided by a marketplace of providers. And again, these aren't new concepts, and certainly given today's climate, but these concepts date right back to the 70s. Frank, uh, Frankenstein and uh, Carbato uh, really laid some of these uh, initial concepts out. All right, the key points of this talk, that one, large-scale communication-centric systems can be achieved through aggressive integration. Fairness can be supported through raw hardware access. Competition and cooperation can be supported as primitives through what we call a dynamic hardware enforced communication domain. Now, hopefully these will make more sense by the time we're done this talk, but I do want to point something out that's very apparent in these key points. A number of the terms and concepts that arise in the talk are non-technical and for that matter imprecise in nature. Fairness, competition, cooperation, and for that matter even global. Now, we actually really do mean their socioeconomic, dictionary-like definitions when we use these terms. Because from our perspective, if you're going to talk about technology like a global computer that can really penetrate our social economic fabrics, it's important to acknowledge and try to integrate these somewhat, perhaps, uh, ill-defined concepts, but to try to address them. And maybe if for no other reason than to act as a catalyst for debate on both sides of the issue, both the technical and non-technical. Now that, sorry, go ahead. You're going to get into the software, of course. Uh, <coughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the, I do want to actually just mention, though, what we mean by fairness, because that one is pretty overloaded in terms of computer science. Uh, really here, what we're referring to is an impartial level playing field for competition and cooperation. And from the perspective of global, I also want to clarify we do not mean universal or singular. Rather, we're referring to worldwide uh, accessibility and worldwide scale. Sort of like the way we think about the internet being worldwide with the ability to publish and access services. Now, some of the benefits that we uh, believe that the approach can lead to, this approach to global computation, is cheaper, smaller global resource footprint, and now open as a hardware platform which places no restrictions on the software or usage model, opposed to closed private systems in which inherently there are uh, restrictions on, to getting direct hardware access and on how you can use it because of system-imposed software. Secondly, we also believe that as an open system, as a hardware system, as a public access system, its main goal is the provisioning of capacity for others to produce products and services, opposed to just being used to utilize excess capacity in a system serving other primary purposes. And finally, we believe that the approach that we uh, are uh, exploring can lead to a scalable, composable system where you can start the system at an arbitrary size and scale up with demand. Okay, so the outline for the rest of the talk, we're going to quickly go over what we mean by global computer and global computation, the aspects that we thought were important. And we're going to spend most of our time on the prototype. Uh, we'll go over the hardware and then the, uh, uh, the systems approach we're taking. Then we'll spend a few minutes talking about why we're taking such a hardware-centric view, especially as uh, for operating systems researchers and uh, our take on virtualization. And virtualization, that sense of hypervisor virtualization. Uh, and then we'll briefly discuss some comments that we think that the pioneers of our field really challenge us to consider if we're going to consider technology like this. So our take on global scale uh, computation and computers is really based on our observations of the internet and of uh, prior work. And really, they're not that complicated. One, widely accessible, communication-centric. I think that's sort of obvious based on the internet. Now, the other two are more about our observations and conjectures about what we think are important to make something viable, both as a technology and as um, within a socioeconomic setting. One is a clear separation from the hardware, from the software, and software as a refinement of the hardware capacity. 
And thirdly, competition and cooperation support being built into the system as a primitive. Now, our take, our definition of a global scale computer, a well-specified, public, softwareless, massive parallel system on which users can construct services of arbitrary scale, of course, given resource limits, out of metered and build common units of its capacity grouped in domains of communication they specify and control. I know that's a whole lot of words, but again, hopefully by the time we come to the end of this talk, it will make more sense. Okay, so on to our prototype. We need a massive parallel processor. In our case, it's BlueGene, and then we're going to talk about its evolution, and then we're going to look at some demos. So, given our approach, we, we need this massive multiprocess parallel processor, and BlueGene P is the current revision of the Blue Gene uh, product line. And I got to tell you, as systems researchers, as operating systems people who have worked on um, parallel processors and building operating systems for parallel processors, we have really found this to be sort of a really remarkable, remarkable machine to play with. We've been having a lot of fun with it. Now, to give you some sense of what the core components and how they integrate together, are for this machine. At the heart of it is a system on a chip. It's a four core PowerPC processor embedded with all the I.O. circuitry so that you can achieve something that looks like this, which is the compute card. The compute card is our basic unit of capacity. Uh, it's the system on a chip plus RAM, and then all it is is the physical interconnect to get our uh, communications. And to be honest, it really isn't that much, or it doesn't look that much different than a memory module on steroids. And that's largely in part because of aggressive integration that one can entertain if one's really going after a design point to, for scale. Now, the compute card is combined on what's called a node card. There are 32 compute cards put into a node card. And the node card also has two additional nodes on it. These nodes are I.O. nodes, and each of them connect to a 10 gigabit Ethernet link, which is pretty important to us because that's how we get to the outside world. That's how we can connect to exterior networks and to storage offerings and devices. The uh, node cards are combined into a rack, so there's 32 node cards per rack, yielding uh, 1024 compute nodes, not counting the 64 associated I.O. nodes. The racks are cabled together to produce a system where it's a seamless integrated system. Now, from our perspective, the real thing that we're interested in, especially with this talk, is to talk about the communication aspects of this machine and what can be done through integration. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that although BlueGene is the machine we're working with, Predominantly for us, the most important aspect is, is that it's an exemplar of what can be achieved with today's technology, rather than the specifics of its, wh what it was exactly designed for, but telling us what we can do given this kind of scale. Now, with that in mind, the designers of BlueGene, when they were considering high-performance computing, they realized that high-performance computing entailed more than one communication pattern. Both strongly scaled applications and weakly scaled applications have different kind of requirements. And now, so rather than shoehorning all the requirements onto a single network, because of integration, they were able to dedicate separate networks for the different types of communication uh, requirements. Now, perhaps the best known, and we'll just quickly go over the five, the perhaps the best known is the three-dimensional torus, which has excellent point-to-point -point, uh, capabilities. So each node can communicate with another node with just a simple point-to-point -point message. The, uh, the next network, which is called the collective network, is a tree. And this has excellent broadcast uh, support, so you can do one-to-all kind of communications. The uh, next one is a low-latency global barrier, an interrupt network, which allows global signaling. And now, again, from our perspective, another important one is this 10 gigabit functional uh, e external Ethernet, which we talked about are on the uh, I.O. nodes, which give us our external uh, connectivity. But it's important to remember the density of that. 
that's two 10 gigabit Ethernet links for every node card. And then finally, something that doesn't get a lot of attention, but as systems builders and OS people, we think is really quite phenomenal, is that there's a one gigabit private control Ethernet that spans every node in the system, but the nodes themselves cannot access. So it's, a, it's like sort of a data center network built into the machine. Data center control network. Okay, but to understand this concept of scaling and integrating the scalable communications into the system, let's contrast it or think about it from the perspective of a typical commercial Ethernet-like architecture. So here we have our uh, Ethernet switch, the green box, and to it we have a bunch of hosts or hardware endpoints represented by the light blue boxes connected to the ports of the switch. Now, to send a message, we send it to the, the uh, host, writes it to its port, the, the switch makes a decision about the destination and sends it out the right port. Now to scale this, because the switch itself is a centralized expensive resource and also has to conform to this notion of arbitrary hosts having been plugged in here, we tend to scale it by cascading these switches, which of course now results in a cascaded routing decision where a message will at each switch decide which port, if any of them, the message should go to. Now, if we're going to scale this, the thing that we can start to do is think about it as a distributed concept. So we can break apart our switch and the functionality of the switch into smaller, smaller switches which have well-known numbers of connections. So in this case, we can lay it out as a two-dimensional grid. And then we can actually combine the hardware endpoints right into the switching infrastructure. And now what we have is something that scales with the number of nodes and can have some very nice design properties. Now, clearly, it may turn out that you might have a higher per hop count for a message. But because of integration, we can really utilize the fact that these are physically, we have a lot of control over it. And we can actually improve the per hop performance. And we can really think about ideal optimal design points for construction. So I hope what you can start to see here is that why large-scale communication-centric systems can be achieved if we really think about aggressive integration. Okay, so what does this mean in BlueGene? How do we translate that? So our node card in BlueGene um, is really from the perspective of the torus, and I'm just going to focus on the torus here, an XYZ coordinate, along with all the links. So it we combine these to actually form the fabric. The fabric isn't something that exists and then we put the nodes in. The nodes form the fabric. And then, of course, we can just simply add more nodes and continue to scale the fabric. So the key points are that every node in the system is just simply an XYZ coordinate. And that, again, the fabric forms is formed from the nodes. But the other thing is that the hardware supports the routing directly in the switch components of each node. So there's no sense that the software gets involved or is aware. It's just like the switches on the Ethernet. The switches cooperate to now have the full routing. And finally, something that uh, sometimes gets confused is that the fabric is global, symmetric, and transparent. That means that for every node, no matter where it's placed, whether it's placed into um, uh, one node card and we're talking to another <laughs> node in the same node card, or whether it's across midplanes and racks. So I didn't actually mention midplanes. That's just a unit of <laughs> half a rack. So to give you some sense of what actually can be purchased today, if one were to ask IBM, and again, if you're actually going to order something from the right, we still wouldn't mind hearing from you. Um, the, uh, so on the left, is what the capacity of a single rack is. So a single rack has 1,024 nodes, as we discussed earlier. And <coughs> given the current configuration, that translates into two terabytes of RAM in that rack. Now, on the far right-hand side, if we consider there, then we've got just about uh, over a quarter million nodes in 256 racks. And that translates into a half a petabyte of storage, uh, RAM storage in the current configuration. Now, if you're going to consider 
a global scale computer, it's really worthwhile starting to think about the practical issues of powering and really wanting to be uh, starting with technology that is efficient with resources. So this is actually some work that was done by our colleagues uh, for Europar 08, in which they did a survey of mega data centers. And these are just some numbers that they were able to give us for comparison. And so the question here was, if you wanted to put one million cores down and make them available, what would it take from a space and power perspective? So using standard servers, what they got was about 50 megawatts of power and about uh, 500 square feet of space. For BlueGene, and we're not arguing equivalency here, we're trying to think about scale. The power perspective is about one-fifth, and the floor space is one-fiftieth. So that gives you some sense of if we're going to actually entertain really, really large machines, there's some real utility in starting to think about what can we do through integration. Yep. So on the right-hand side, the disk farms and the disk capacity sits in that data center as well as rack. So that 10 gigabit Ethernet, Ethernet links connect to disk storage. So, so the same amount of storage in each I have to go back to those numbers. I can't remember if what we did was they extracted disks from both of them or they combined disks in both of them. Given the number of, of spindles and cross-section, yeah. Okay, so let's consider the, uh, what we're doing now as our prototype. What are we trying to do with this machine to move it forward? So, uh, and to be honest, in many ways, we're just carrying on some work that Hillis predicted in the, uh, in the 80s with the connection machine. That, but, you know, there is an interesting point here, historically speaking, because this was the first time that utility computing took, well, maybe it's the first time that we're aware of, that it took the step away from saying, oh, just have really, really hot, dense CPUs that are partitioned through operating systems, but think about what you can do with parallel processors. So just as a review, so now our question arises, how do we take our internet-like computation and map it into this type of fabric? And again, our goal is, to produce this environment. And the only reason I'm showing this to you again is because it can start to get a little confusing in the next few, few slides, and it's good to keep these pictures in your mind. So what we're going to do to this uh, communication fabric is we're going to start adding some hardware features, or at least exploring the adding of them since we can't actually fab anything just at a snap of a finger. But the first thing that we're going to talk about is a control channel. And these control channels in some ways, you can just think of it like a souped-up serial line that's going to have some multicast capability. And that's really going to lead to us on how we're going to achieve raw hardware access. And then we're going to talk about communication domains, which is a way for the system to enforce communication sets that the users, when they configure their hardware, can define. OK, so from the aspect of the... Uh, uh, control channels. I keep wanting to tip my laptop to see if I could push that down, but I guess that's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the control channel, especially from a systems build, it's really quite simple. What we want is something that has the same properties like a serial line, which means that we want a simple, simple device where you pour bits in on one side and it shows up on the other side and vice versa, so that you can develop things like consoles, like initial I.O., to, to develop firmware and operating systems. Now, the trick here, though, is so our, our control channel is going to be represented from the hardware's perspective as a device. So we call it the node control channel device. And what we're going to do is we're going to, when we configure the node, we're going to assign the control channel device to a multicast channel. So to give you an idea, if we have our system, and on the lower right-hand corner here, we have our pool of nodes. And we have our users on the left. So if a user makes a request for a node, we're going to assign the, control, the, the node 
uh, indicated by now with a fill blue circle, and we'll use those fill blue circles to represent an allocated node, we're going to assign its control channel device to a channel that we've allocated for it. And this is going to create a group that the user can interact with through a relay point. So we're going to construct a public accessible relay point that the user can read and write to speak to that control channel. Now, that relay point, that's obviously something that's of interest because on the one hand, the relay point gets to speak within our hardware environment. That can be secured by our hardware environment. On the other side, of course, it's speaking over the public access channel. Now, this is certainly not ideal yet, and this is certainly where we're working towards, but our approach here is to create relay points that use whatever the best case standard public domain uh, security protocols are. So in, in our case of our prototype, as you'll see, that's actually an SSH or secure shell channel. But I'll get into a second how one can evolve over that because we're giving you raw hardware access. So now if we have a second allocation, clearly we would, uh, we would first, if it was for more number of nodes, in this case three, we would take each of the console channel devices and configure them for the same multicast channel. Now that means that that relay point, when you read and write to it, you're actually speaking to all of the nodes simultaneously. Now, if you don't particularly like the public encryption system that's being used to give you your first public access to the nodes, you can load onto the nodes arbitrary software which is going to tunnel whatever you feel comfortable with on those nodes. Now, there are clearly issues about windows of vulnerability and so on with this approach, but I'm going to leave it at this for the moment and we can come back to that if, if you'd like to talk about more, more about that at the end. So, although I haven't really talked about the fairness aspect here, what I want you to get the idea is that how we're starting to look at allocating raw nodes out to people, opposed to something that has software that's constructing these virtual things that they're going to be interacting with. Okay, so now on to the communication domains, which is perhaps a slightly more interesting and a little harder concept, only marginally so. So a domain we're going to represent by these ellipses. Now we're going to represent the hardware endpoints by the blue circles again, and now we're going to group those endpoints into these ellipses. Uh, endpoints that are within an ellipse are allowed to speak to, with each other, so they can communicate with each other. And endpoints can be in more than one domain. And you can start through that to form topologies. And you can also have well-known domains that exist, like an external domain, so that if a node is placed in that external domain, it has accessibility to the exterior networks. Or we can also give and provide a public domain that's well known so that you can start creating a, a, a well known interior public kind of space for interaction. Now, what we're trying to realize here is we're trying to give the possibility to have the uh, realization of these kind of socioeconomic relationships <coughs> expressed in the topologies of the communication domains. The next slide will try to get into that or express that a little better. But what I want to to um, walk away with is that this is our approach to starting to say how people can say, I want my resources to be protected because no one else can get at them, or how I can punch holes and I can say, oh, I want to communicate with some other people and I'm going to place it in a shared or public domain. But from our perspective of implementation, what we think is critical is that the hardware is going to enforce these communication constraints. And in many ways, this is much more like a permission set. It's not a protocol definition, it's a permission expression. And the software is going to control everything else. It's going to control what and how is communicated, or how and what is communicated. So it's a little cut off here, but so if the software chooses to communicate with raw bus access, because in many ways the networks of an integrated machine tend to be, represent more like a bus than it does a network, or you know, they can choose to send cache lines, or they can choose to send Ethernet frames. And you can imagine that the Ethernet frames are sort of important for the examples that we'll show for trying to capture the internet usage models. <clears throat> okay, so let's walk through this just a little, in a little more detail about the communication domains as a permission expression. So on the right-hand side, what we have illustrated here is an adjacency matrix, where along the left, 
are the identifiers for our hardware nodes. And here we're illustrating our hardware nodes down at the bottom as the blue circles. And their hardware identifiers are the numbers labeled in them. And on the top are destination points. So the question that we want to be able to express is, is X allowed to communicate with Y? So we would look up the appropriate cell in the matrix. If it has a 1, we answer that question in the positive. And if it's empty, then you're not allowed to communicate. So given that, if we wanted 0 and 4 to be able to communicate, we would update the matrix appropriately. And now if we wanted to think about this as a communication domain, the domain get, tells us now these nodes are going to form a set. So this is how to update the matrix if I want to add something to that set that are going to be allowed to communicate. So if I add 3, we'd update the matrix appropriately. <coughs> now, clearly we can keep doing this and build various topologies. And if we were to interpret this as a physical network topology, like we were running Ethernets, what we would see is nodes that have, that are more than one domain, sort of represent nodes that have multiple interfaces, where each domain here sort of represents a switch. And now we can start to see that with the domains, one approach is that we can, if we run the appropriate software, we can model it, these domain configurations, as an Ethernet. Now, this is really how we're starting to think about having a fundamental primitive over which users can specify and control that allows them to support notions of competition and cooperation through some hardware enforcement. OK, so let's try to put these things together to realize our system model. So the first thing down at the bottom, which I've sort of glossed over each time, is our pool of resources. So this is our big, massive um, parallel processor. And the uh, light blue squares are our nodes. So they're going to be our common units of capacity. From here, we have a notion of an authenticated principle, which can allocate and make requests to our service interface. So in this case, our principle is uh, asking for three units of uh, capacity. Now the system is going to maintain configurations for each principle. So it's layered to try to give the indication that there's separate configurations for each principle. And in this case, we're viewing the configuration for the, print, the red principle. So we're going to take three nodes out of our uh, capacity pool. And we're going to configure them in a control channel. But we're also going to take the additional parameters that the user can specify and create communication domains to control how these nodes are going to be able to communicate. And we're going to return back to the user the control channel. And that's it. At that point, the nodes are theirs, and they can do whatever they want with them. In the next couple of slides, I'll try to show you how we use this to actually bootstrap a useful environment. But from the most part, this is now what we give them. And of course, they can continue to make additional requests, constructing more complex uh, personal environments. So from a software perspective, our notion is that, after all, we said it was sort of software-less. So the base is just this kind of U-shape. We're going to have the hardware, and we're going to support a couple things. One, we've already talked about this con control channel, which the hardware is going to expose out as an interface so that arbitrary layers of software can access it. And we're also going to have something that the hardware exports out so that the metering of that your usage can also be accessed from the software in case you want to start doing things like billing or understanding your usage. And the hardware itself, of course, will support those communication domains. From there, you can load on arbitrary configurations of software. So everything in this diagram, all the green layers, are software. Now, it looks pretty traditional. You can choose to put some sort of HAL on it. You could choose to pour virtualization on it. And if you pour virtualization, you're free to re-abstract the communication domains as ethernets or distributed hash tables or distributed shared memory you could try to implement or whatever sort of strikes your fancy. And then, of course, God forbid you should do something like put an operating system and run some applications on them. Now, 
from our prototypes perspective. What do we actually have and what are we currently working with? So our base layer is the BlueGene P system. And as I uh, talked about earlier, our relay points for the control channels are implemented using uh, the secure shell protocol. And then what we've done is we've prototyped uh, a firmware or a bootloader by taking an open source package called U-Boot and adding to it the necessary device software so that it could interact with the underlying network fabrics of BlueGene. Now, as I said earlier, unfortunately we can't just, uh, at a snap of the fingers, uh, fab our changes to support the uh, communication domains and control channels. At this juncture in time, the enforcement of those communication domains and those algorithms we are prototyping in that device software. Similarly, we've taken Linux and added all the necessary device driver work to also give it the ability to communicate over those fabrics. And particularly, we've also made those fabrics appear like, so that a communication domain can appear like a separate Ethernet, each communication domain. And then, of course, because it's Linux, we can take the wide body of uh, Linux uh, uh, application and user level code and use it to construct environments. We're also now trying out the L4 microkernel to uh, act as a virtualization layer so that we can play with what kind of algorithms and, and our actual uh, implementation of these security primitives, what changes we would like to the hardware through that layer, and also to provide someone with an example of a virtualization of this hardware. Now, to understand how we actually combine this to actually produce some computational environments so that we can actually do something, there's two aspects. One, I want to talk to you just a little bit about an approach we've taken to being able to construct building blocks from, the lin from a Linux distribution. So the first thing is we take a full-blown Linux distribution and since what we know our target is, is that we want to be able to have these nodes that are under my control, that I can write to them, or I can at least interact with them over a control channel, I want to be able to create things that I can bootstrap them with. So how I get my initial RAM load. And so what we do is we take this Linux full distribution, we wrote a little, some just simple tools that allow us to extract and produce bootable RAM disks. The Linux kernel has this ability that I can place in memory a RAM disk image, and when it, it starts up, it simply goes, oh, there's a RAM disk, oh, that's my root file system, run. And then, of course, we can customize that root file system to run whatever application we would like that we've placed in there. And to just give you some idea, here are some various ones that, that we use. Uh, one that's just, you know, three megabytes, just as a shell, a 10 megabyte one that has an SSH server, um, one that combines uh, uh, an x86 Linux on top of a simulator, all the way down to a file server that's running a logical volume manager and an NFS server at about 28 megabytes. So what do we do with these? Now, I told you that our approach was that we want to give you raw hardware. So raw hardware doesn't really know what to do other than run in the, a, a reset state. So what we do is we preload this bootloader. But I want to make it clear, the goal is not that this bootloader is burned in or some sort of blessed piece of software. As a matter of fact, we'd even go far as, so far as to say the bootloader and the one we give you is probably not of a real high functional point that you're interested in. We want to encourage you to simply replace that bootloader with things that you find more interesting, providing more function that you're interested in. But it gives you an initial way to be able to throw some software on there. Whether that's your own bootloader, or in, like in our case, it's a kernel plus a set of applications. Okay. All that being said, let's actually walk through a little bit some of the demos we built. Now, because of um, the sake of the talk, I can't actually connect and run these demos. But all these demos are available as QuickTime movies on our website. And I really do encourage you to go at them. And, and each of one of them, before I go into it, I'll present the URL 
and feel free to go and download these. Now, that being said, I'm going to try to explain these demos. So the demos that you'll find on the website don't have a voiceover, and they can be complicated to understand. So you may actually find that the version of the slides that end up on the, the website for this course will, if you use this portion of the talk, you'll be able to better understand what each of the demos is doing and means. So for the sake of the talk, I'm going to have put some timestamps that you can use to key into the movies to understand what's going on at that point. Unfortunately, though, it is a live demo, which means I was typing it, and there's lots of typos and stuff. So these times and their deltas don't only combine the key operations. They also combine my inability to type. Uh, so uh, when you go through the movies, though, you'll have a better sense of what is happening. OK, so the very first one, let me just back up, is we're going to do a very quick demo where what we're going to do is build a scalable web farm. So what are we seeing? We're seeing my ugly desktop. Um, and down at the bottom, the just standard Linux windows where I'm going to issue commands that are going to interact with that service interface. Up at the top is I'm going to present this ethereal view. Now, this is not a view that a user would actually get to see. This is something that we're trying to help visualize the system with so that you can understand it. Because those that are, are uh, systems or operating systems people know that trying to demo system software is, is like a really painful thing. And so we'll take whatever we can get. So at this top is this ethereal view of the system. And then what we're going to find, each time something happens, a window may pop up there to indicate that a new domain was created and a node has been put into it. So again, what we're going to start with is we're going to ask the system for a node. And we're going to acquire that node, load that node with one of these appliances that contain the Apache web server. And we're going to boot it. So at this point, we've booted it. And we've also done an HTTP GET. So we've actually just gone, sorry, a, a W GET. So we've gone and made a request to the web server and gotten it back. So remembering, the desktop is outside the machine on an exterior network. We've asked this node to be placed on the exterior network. And we've configured it with, uh, you know, we've loaded it up with some software that's running a web server. Now, of course, the real power of this is that what we did with one node, just simply changing the the little script that I write, or the little commands I write, changing that 1 to a 10, I can simply add 10 more. And then, of course, the whole idea is that 10, 200, 2,000, of course, we unfortunately don't have that much blue gene resource right now to play with in our research lab uh, for our project. So we're limited in terms of the numbers that we can actually show the demos at. But I do want to point out, so that was in a minute and 30, with all my typing, with all the interactions to actually query these web servers and ensure they're up and load them up. We just created a successive stage of a web farm going from 1 to 200. OK, but that's great. So we've talked a little bit about this, this kind of using an appliance to build a, a canned kind of fixed web server-like environment. But how about something that is more akin to that initial um, picture I showed? So let's try to build an intranet. So this might look familiar. We're going to build this type of intranet on top of the capacity. So we're going to have a, a node that's allocated an exterior gateway. We're going to have one main ethernet that's going to be sort of our little corporate uh, ethernet. And off of that, we're going to hang some workers. And we're going to hang a pretty standard thing, a file server. And then we're going to do something to, we have to think about, well, what are we going to do about storage here? Now, with a global scale computer, there are many, many options from taking the kind of things that we see today in the marketplace, which is to have a dedicated storage offering that you're, you can uh, buy units from, to using your own public storage offerings, because after all, we, you can configure your nodes to have real internet connectivity. Or you can start to think about, well, what would you do with raw capacity? So in this case, what we're going to focus on in our demos are, what are the things we can do with nodes? Now, we can have a debate as to whether this makes sense or not for this example. And there are a lot of interesting trade-offs, especially when you start considering about how and where live and hot data lives today, and how much of it actually should be and you want in RAM. OK, all that being said, what we're going to have is another node, which is called the disk server, or the disk factory, that's going to live on our main ethernet. And that node is going to acquire resources 
in this case, these nodes, and it's going to convert those nodes into disks. And how is it going to do that? Again, just using open source software, it's going to load those nodes with an appliance, and that appliance is going to have installed on it um, eight, uh, so AOE, which is ATA over Ethernet, which is just an a open standard for tunneling, or not tunneling, but yeah, a tunneling, the ATA protocol over Ethernet. And the ATA protocol is just a hardware-based protocol for disks. So once it's booted those up, those nodes are now going to be disks. The file server can see those disks, and it can use standard open source Unix uh, methodologies for converting those disks into logical volume groups. So convert those disks into one large pool, and then build file systems on top of it. OK. So another thing that's worth pointing out here, something that sort of comes for free in this environment is, although I, you know, it looks like I'm running custom commands, I'm not running custom commands. I'm just running scripts that anybody could write and automate the construction of their environments, store them, hand them out, and modify them. So although we're not explicitly trying to say, this is the answer to all management, what we're saying is that some simple hardware primitives can really give people the basis to build very interesting environments for configuring, controlling, and building management systems. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to allocate our gateway and our main ethernet. So just in case you can't read it, that's Network ID 17. At this point, we have booted the gateway. And because it's on the exterior network, we're going to access it through uh, as a real host. And we're going to SSH some extra software onto it. At this point, it's been all loaded. And we're up and running. And we've uh, done some logins into it. At this point, we've allocated another node for, to act as our file server. And in doing so, of allocating the node for the file server, We've also allocated this private disk network. At this point, we've allocated the disk server, and it's booted. And at this point, we're about to run a command on the disk server to start building up our disk pool. So now, this is something I didn't quite explain when we had just our simple abstract view of the system, which showed the system interface being accessible to the public access network. But what's critical is that the system interface is also available internally to the machine. So you can start building environments that can support themselves. They can be self-contained. They can start asking the system for more resources. So in this case, this interior machine is going to ask for more resources. And in this case, it asks for a node. It's loaded that node with the uh, software. It's now a disk. And at this point, the file server has taken that disk, it's created a logical volume, it's created a file system, and it's just done a DF, and yeah, lo and behold, it's pretty small, a 1.4 gig disk. So then it allocates eight more nodes to act as more disks. And at this point, so we went from 325 to 329, and we have our eight more nodes, and now those nodes are booted and available as disks. And at this point, the file system, the logical volume, the file system, just this is not our magic, right? Yep, go ahead. Do you take a locality in consideration when you're doing these um, resource allocation? Are you, are you doing that with locality? Uh, Awareness. Yes. Sure. Um, I'm going to quickly just address it, but then I'd, I'd actually really like to get to that point at the end of the talk because there's a lot. But so locality is a fascinating issue when you consider something like a toroidal mesh. Now the glib answer is well, consider what happens on Ethernet's today. There's very very little locality, and so our first base level is to try to provide arbitrary connectivity. Now locality itself, we believe, and one approach to it is to actually expose it out for other people to try to build locality sets out of. One of the standard approaches right, is to always cut the problem by not having to address it. right? But we can talk about that some more at the end, because it is a fascinating point when you consider these machines and the new possibilities they open for us. Absolutely. Hardware gives you that. And then, but how do you, you, you physically plug them in? then when you want to switch their locality, you physically have to go unplug them. And then if you have thousands of machines or hundreds of thousands of machines in a data center, that's non-trivial. 
And of course, as all operating system things, when you allocate a resource, the notions of fragmentation, internal and external fragmentation, and all that kind of stuff, allocators are very complex issues. OK, uh, but very, very quickly, OK, then we go to our gateway, and we say, oh, give me some workers. And those workers are loaded. And then we boot them. And please go and look at the demo for the rest of the details. OK, but so far, we've only built things that look like custom things that have been built out of appliances. Now, that's not to say that we don't actually believe that approach is actually very, very interesting to build scalable environments. But our point is that we also want to make sure that this is a general purpose-like environment. Now, we're not, again, arguing that this is the best way to use this resource. But we, we know that, practic practically speaking, if we can't give people a natural way to move forward and advance how they use their computation from standard mechanisms, we just don't have a chance for a global scale computer. So in this one, we're going to actually build things not just running appliances, but we're still going to build it out of the same building block. So in this case, we take our script, we run it, and we have our pre-can now environment from the last demo. This time, though, we're going to place on the disks, which are just nodes, full-blown Linux installation. And now we're going to boot a node into a full-blown Linux install. And in this case, it happens to be Fedora Core 8. And the white window is just a login into that node, because I actually put it on the exterior network. And then I you know, run some programs that sort of you run, um, XIs and XClock. But the other thing is, because I gave it exterior connectivity, this node, I can also start up, in this case, the Java applet viewer and point it to a URL to the outside world. Excuse me, to the outside world. And it does everything that one would expect. And of course, being an operating system person, the only really useful thing I know how to do is start Emacs and, run and compi uh, uh, write and compile Hello World. So I do that. And then, of course, the next thing that I've been taught how to do is to go to the exterior world and fetch the Linux kernel from kernel.org and start a build. Now, at this point, of course, I'm starting to scratch my head. I, I'm on you know, arguably one of the world's largest supercomputers. It seems a little silly to use a single processor to, or a single node for processors to do my work, especially when these machines are designed to be, have value in their scale. So I stop the compile. And I, I, again, trying to show what we can do with just very, very quickly with open source software, I stop the compile. I ask for some more workers. I put them internal to my network, so these do not have external connectivity. And I run um, a package called DISCC. For those who aren't familiar, it's just a simple, well, I don't want to argue it's simple. It is a package which allows multiple machines to, uh, to donate their resources into a compile farm. Uh, the details are it runs the preprocessor, and it ships off a fully, a full, um, pre-processed uh, file, it compiles it, and then the node sends back the object file. So in this case, I just simply ask for some more nodes, and I restart my compile. I configure those to have the distributed CC. And in this case, you're just seeing another window that shows that the work is being distributed out to those extra nodes. OK, so I think that's it for the demos. But I do want to point out that there's another demo that's on the website called primitives.move. And that one shows the interactions with our low-level service interface, which is very crude at this point. Um, but all of these demos have been built out of what you can see in this um, uh, demo. OK, so why do we take such a hardware-centric view? Now, perhaps a bit of a oh. <laughs> You can't see my heresy because it's up there. But let me just read it for you. Uh, inherent virtualization runs counter to a fair system, and a virtual computer is not a computer. Hoping that the last statement is not terribly controversial. But the, the former may be. The truth of the matter is that, so let's just remember what virtualization in our context is. Because again, as computer scientists, we've got so many overloaded words. What I'm talking about here is virtualization in the form that one expects from a hypervisor, a machine monitor, an operating system, which is the ability to take express computation in virtual contexts and have them execute on a physical set of resources 
where I might have different requirements as to what I'm trying to optimize around. And that's an important thing. Virtualization is real technology. And especially as an operating systems person, I view it, I have to schedule. I have to answer some questions. I have to say, which virtual context goes to which physical context? What virtual memory maps or is scheduled to what physical memory? How do I deal with I.O.? When I have all these VLANs and all those other things flying around, someone has to make the decision. And I've got to implement security. I've got to, I've got to decide whether I, maybe it's got really good hardware features, maybe it doesn't. I have to decide how I'm going to present. I have to decide how I'm going to even export the primitives for using those virtual contexts and creating them. Do I want to optimize around utilization? If it is I am optimizing around utilization, which key components am I wanting to optimize utilization around? Now, in our opinion, because it's real value, it should be separated. And people should have choices over how they want that virtual world of that, that's optimizing their capacity to be. And in many ways, we actually view virtualization as a service, or a derivative, or a future on the underlying hardware capacity. Now, that of course, those words derivative and future raise up a whole new set of questions, and especially if you consider what's going on in the world today. But I'm going to leave that for the end of the talk if you want to talk about that, because we'll touch on it again. Um, so I want to point out, again, lots of this stuff isn't new. And in the 70s, there were some economists who really started being really interested in this whole notion of utility computing. And Nielsen, did I get the name right? Yeah, Nielsen here at Stanford pointed out that users are going to want to be able to make some trade-offs. And one of the trade-offs they're going to want to be able to do is be able to do a price to certainty trade-off. Where they might choose to set a price and get the capacity regardless of what their certainty guarantees are. Or they may be willing to pay and pay because certainty matters to them. Now, we believe one of the most straightforward ways to achieving that, now there are other ways, but the, one of the most straightforward ways to achieving that is by separating the hardware capacity and again treating things like virtualization as an opportunity for others to address this kind of trade-off. And therefore, it's that provider's choice as to whether what kind of certainty criteria they're going to adhere to or try to sell their customers but knowing that the hardware, which may, its price may fluctuate given that it becomes scarce, but it's separately priced. So I hope that starts to tie back this notion of why we believe that fairness can be achieved by starting to expose out that the base block that you work with is a hardware resource. Okay, so some thoughts and advice from some of the pioneers of our field and some of our takes on it. Because Many of these things have really influenced why we've taken the approach we have. So this, and this by no means is exhaustive, but really this goes back to the real pioneers of our field. And I'm really going to stress John McCarthy because the next slide goes through some things that I think were very influential for us to think about. So I'm not going to read these, but basically John McCarthy really understood that competition was going to be inherent in the machine and that services built on top of it would have to have support competition. And he also looked at this notion of it being an economic resource. And Licklider, of course, really understood these notions of communication. And he really understood that it wasn't a sole compute thing, it's about communication, which brings up a whole fascinating set of things which turned things around in utility computing because all of a sudden, the only thing we really knew how to do well before the internet was actually build really hot centralized processors, which actually don't actually scale well economically with uh, the economics of scale, and don't support com uh, communication the way that was expected. OK, uh, the one that I would like to point out a little bit is that Fano and David, in their paper in 65, really saw the fact that just the existence of very powerful computer systems make them a serious threat to privacy of the individual and all sorts of notions. And this is a great paper. And of course, for us, Multics itself as operating systems people were, you know, the whole idea was starting to think about how are you going to think about scheduling and all these things from the perspective of it being 
something that's going to have significant social consequences someday. Okay, um, three more because I can't help it. At some point, we will actually put uh, a bibliography on our website, which has many, many more interesting papers. But I want to point this one out just partially because it relates to my alma mater, but also it's a fantastic book. From 66, in those days, you could actually pick up a book on something like utility computing, and it was this big, opposed to I'm sure if we picked up a book on cloud computing, it would be this big today. And he talks about some fantastic things. And one, which I really suggest everyone reads, is this great little analogy to the Oracle of Delphi and uh, today's uh, computing. Um, this one I already mentioned, of the computer utility as a marketplace. And again, there was some early work done by um, economists that really forced the issue about, well, what, how are you going to trade off different pricing strategies? OK, finally. Um, this, isn't not, this is not a question about when this is going to happen. It's a question about how it's going to happen. And McCarthy really uh, you know, made that statement for us. Oh, these are all quotes from McCarthy. Um, the main danger is to be avoided is the creation of a, of a service of limited scope. And our approach to that has been to say, to avoid people being able to have control over what can be done is to produce a machine that has the primitives necessary for raw hardware access. And again, that this notion of, um, of the software and hardware being um, separated is critical and important. So that not out of just sheer size of owning the hardware do you get to control everything that happens on the machine. Finally, again, the key point of the talk, a large-scale communication-centric system can be uh, achieved through aggressive integration. We believe that fairness can be supported through raw hardware access and that the basic primitives for competition and cooperation can be achieved by thinking about how to add some features to the hardware for things like a dynamic hardware enforced communication domain. And uh, something that we also think is very important these days is that it's all of our responsibilities. We are not arguing that this is our approach is the one and only and the best. But this stuff is happening today, whether we like it or not, and it's up to all of us to be involved in both in education and in what actions we take to integrate and engage in a, uh, with society about it. So, our digital future is at hand. We think there's lots of fun to be had. And like FANA, we, we don't have all the answers, but we think there's some great questions to ask. And that's it. Uh, I don't know. How did I do the time? Oh, it, uh, you were going to say no, just, uh, how, how much time do we have? I, I, I have no idea because I have no watch. <laughs> uh, so. Five more minutes. Okay, well. Sorry. See the camera goes off. So what, what are you doing about resources? Right, so the, the question arises about which resources do we want to control. Now, we really would like to control the least number of resources. So from our perspective, the notion of allocating the hardware out is it's yours. And when we run out, we believe that something that's going to become apparent in a global system, especially one that once we start acknowledging its public value, it's got to be a feedback mechanism to all of us about do we want to grow it? Or is that scarcity of resource as it's happening, being expressed in the increase in price, sufficient? And if not, how can we track it? I mean, the notion of having transparency about the amount of resource that's available. But you, you just said mm -hmm. an interesting word, price. But <laughs> you have, are you pricing these things? Is there a payment? Is, right. they, is I, I, this real money? Is this funny money? Right. Yeah. In our current prototype, there's, we're not pricing it at this juncture in time. But what we're trying to build are all the pieces that are necessary to, to know what the units are, where they've been allocated, and then to have some extra hardware features that let you do things like, oh, if you want to build even more fancy systems, like do you want to do it rather than node allocation, but you actually want some primitives for understanding uh, cycles, instructions, and so on. The hardware provisions those things. And to a large extent, the, our job, uh, we see that from a technical perspective, is try to put the underpinnings in place to let those kind of explorations go on. But we haven't. We haven't fixed or pinned that specific pricing model. So right now, there's no incentive not to just allocate it. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. No, no, no. And as a matter of fact, uh, yeah. <laughs> we allocate like there's no tomorrow. 
So there was once a there's a quote that somebody made about you know being perhaps a market for in the world for perhaps five computers and you know today we say those computers might be like Google, Amazon, Yahoo, maybe folding at home or something. None of those look anything like the system you're proposing. Like what is like sort of why not or what is the advantage of or the difference of your approach? Let me try to although I'm not terribly the best with PowerPoint here. Um, I'm actually gonna also hang on one sec. But before I answer, let me just give a quick answer, make sure there's other answers, because this one could go on for a little while. Um, so was there another question you wanted to ask? Yep. Yeah, you put up that table that showed who controlled the access to different nodes, and could you sort of address uh, kind of like the privacy and the security uh, issues associated with that in particular? Who has control of that table? How is it monitored? Is that true? Mm, okay. Okay. So um, yeah, let me answer that one first, just because I think we can do that relatively quickly. So. Um, that, that abstraction of that permission set, I think, is what you're talking about. So there, that's the, currently, we do, right? The, the provider, of the maintainer of the system controls that table. You ask us for resources, we fill that abstract table out and configure the hardware. But, so there's two, there's two important points here. The hardware enforces it. And it, there is no policy mechanism that's ever in play. We are never actively, there's no software running, there's no, there's no interaction that we do when you are computing to enforce that. It's something that's hardware enforced. Now, that larger question, which I think is what you're hinting at as well, is, well, is that right? Who, who should we trust for that? And what should we do about it? And we think that's exactly the kind of question that needs to be asked. So do we have it so that we eventually work towards a public specification of the hardware that everybody knows that we can have, much like we have auditors for other uh, utilities and so on, that can ensure that the system is meeting that and that the things that we claim are enforced in the hardware and that the hardware specification and the hardware, perhaps even the, impl even the implementation can be open for audit. Those, I think, are all fascinating questions. And we're at this point in time trying to ask, well, given the hard or given the technology we have, can we at least start looking at way, ways to ask those questions and force those issues to say, well, what do we want to do here? Um, but the short answer right now in the system, the system, we, when we configure the node before we hand it to you, we configure that table, we, and the hardware enforces it, or at least our low-level software does at this juncture in time, and, they, and that's how it works. Okay, so the question arose, so this thing that we're talking about doesn't particularly look like systems that are out there. Well, that's a touchy point because one, I don't actually know what systems out there look like because no one's willing to tell me what systems out there look like. <laughs> um, but I am going to make a few observations. So we've got a lot of resource illustrated by this, this kind of big yellow circle. Now, I've got some choices if I want to have this resource used by multiple people. I could partition it and break it up and then have this natural notion of a distributed ownership model, which is sort of what we think of in the internet today. And I, you know, get this choice. I, if I communicate over a network, which that round circle in the middle is supposed to represent, that they're now, I've broken the resource into physical different pieces and I can communicate. Now, of course, I have the downside that I have this inflexible uh, communication topology that I'm bound to because I'm talking about three space. But the other option I have is I could centralize and split it up, which is much more akin to what original utility computing looked like. Now, the uh, ownership tends to be centralized here and sharing tends to be inherent because I can't do anything about it because whoever chose to place a policy in place and technology in place to do the carving up, I'm inherently using it. But global utilization tends to be something that one naturally thinks about. Now, I would argue as I just mentioned, original notions of time sharing and, and utility computing started there. The internet moved us to here, and cloud computing is moving us right back here. Now, once it, whether it lives inside a big building or not, the fact that these resources are being arbitrated, how they're individually set up, whether they're set up like a machine like BlueGene, whether they're set up like machines like clusters of <coughs> machines, the question is, someone is handing out resources and 
and choosing some mechanism for handing that out. And given that most providers today are looking at virtualization, I would really argue that it doesn't matter that it's on a cluster of computers. It's still a question of some form of um, time sharing. Now, I would argue that our machine that we're talking about is trying to explore this hybrid model. Can we have distributed ownership, which could be audited potentially, but still have some of the advantages of, of consolidation? Now, I hope I haven't totally veered off your, your question, but the, the point that what these computers look like inside and what are demands of these computers, what we demand of these providers, have to come into, uh, we have to find some way to marry the two. And the question of whether the, some set of computers inside some corporation looks like BlueJean versus another, I, I agree, it's unknown. I happen to think that, as I pointed out at the beginning of the talk, if you're going to move towards real consolidation, we have a number of options. And we're going to actually entertain how we, integration, sorry, and how we audit these machines and how we actually implement them. We're open now to ask some interesting questions. And I think that's a more interesting avenue to approach is what kind of things do we want the hardware to support? And the fact that, you know, with integration, I think as all of us uh, as systems builders know that we can pick our PowerPoint much more efficiently. We can pick our space point much more efficiently rather than letting it ha have potentially evolved or devolved from so-called commodity standards. And, yeah. Go ahead. So I asked the question early on yeah. about software, mm -hmm. and I have to say, you know, your presentation still confuses me. Okay. And I was Danny Hills' audience when he introduced the connection. Okay. Machine. And we were able to, the people in the audience were able to tell him, Danny, you're doing wrong things, kiss of death, which, you know, ultimately killed uh, the Game Machines Corporation, which was, oh, we're going to go with Starless and a new, and a new language called C Star. Right. And within two years, he came crawling back, literally said, we heard you. We created a Fortran compiler, <laughs> as an example. <laughs> and for what you showed so far is, yeah. OK, so you're going to do C in Linux. And, and you know, sure, every, every system with both of those can be tweaking things to both of those. You're probably going to use MPI for, for message passing, <laughs> but that's not clear. The only thing we've seen so far in terms of software oh, okay. is, <laughs> is your disk CC, which Okay. okay, so that's okay for internet type things, but not so clear to me about um, you know single single solutions on a, on distributed across multiple processors and the like. So, anyways, my, my point to you is that I'm still, with the exception of just CC, I don't see a lot of software here that's that's new. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. I hope you don't see software that's quote unquote new. Our job at this juncture in point is to expose the hardware and this scale of hardware out for innovation. What we do absolutely need to do is ensure that we've seen many systems fail because the very first thing they do is they tell you, oh, I have got the language. I have got the software model that's going to rule the world. Truth of the matter is, software runs on hardware. Next truth of the matter is, we've got an awful lot of software out there that has to run. It's not, a, it's not an option for us as computer scientists to say, oh, it's all going to get better when my new thing comes out. We have an obligation these days to make sure certain types of software runs. Our approach has been is to take a machine that we know people can do so much better with, but give you a way to get access to it, advance it in some ways to provide specific properties that we believe are useful for global scale computation that has also socioeconomic implications, and then let the barn doors open. Now, there are, I'm sorry, uh, there are many, many different approaches. Now, uh, one might have even argued, well, was that really the internet as an application? Because after all, that's good. what is application? What is internet? So I just want to point out three different models here. So of course, we showed you predominantly this notion of taking internets and mapping them right onto, or networks and things, mapping them right onto direct one-to-one -one mappings onto software and using Linux predominantly. But there's nothing stopping. One of the key points of the system is while that's happening, there's nothing stopping someone allocating big chunks of or small chunks of resources and running something completely different. Like in this case, this is actually um, uh, a picture from the Blue Brain Project 
to run neural networks and simulations on BlueGene, which it happens to be pretty good at. Um, and then, of course, there's another approach altogether. It doesn't have to be so esoteric. I can write lots of interesting distributed software, and I don't have to use MPI. If I choose to use MPI, by all means, but you can exploit, because the idea is that we would give you the entire raw hardware specification for those networks. So if you want to make trade-offs and build a super simulator that happens to simulate networks and machines, great. If you want to build an application that is totally disconnected, that does search or it does protein folding, by all means. And then if you want to have some of the nodes still run something that can connect and interact with TCP IP, great. So again, our hope isn't not to tell you that we've invented the best software in the world. Our hope is to show that we've built an environment for software to evolve. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite see that. Okay. It's just, it's just simply your presentation. Like I said, it gets, it gets the this CC thing. And, I mean, I realize you guys at Watson, you guys did this beautiful machine called the RP3. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of NYU stuff there with a the fetch app and the like. Mm -hmm. Sure, maybe the guys at Livermore can come over and revive the CISL programming language to run and uh, turn this into a data flow machine. But I'm just telling you that I, I, I don't see all the software. You, okay. you haven't said I, enough about software in your presentation. I'll come back. I'm going to let a few other questions come by. And then if, if My there's questions are related to this okay. uh, I think a lot of these questions are, are, are asking the same thing that I've been thinking about for the last 30 minutes is actually what the thesis of your talk is. And your talk is, is about hardware. And this question here was essentially not how these, will you support all these different types of machines. The question is that we essentially have this idea of Google and Amazon and these people running very, very different types of hardware to provide a very similar type of service. And I thought your thesis here was going to be, we believe that through large-scale integration, and building into hardware fundamental primitives of administration and other things like that, we can provide the hardware as a service at lower cost, and we, be, we will beat the heck out of those guys. And so I just want to make sure that, is that what you were saying here, or are you just saying we all need to be thinking a lot more about utility-based computing? So as uh, an IBM researcher, <clears throat> there are clearly questions of business value and so on about building machines and about administration and so on. I think the real question that we were trying to separate out as a question of public value and a question of where can we go with advanced systems, when we think about this kind of scale, it, it's really quite staggering when you can construct machines with today's technology that represent you know, such huge numbers. It really begs us to say, well, what can we do to transit interesting work and let others have access to it. So in some ways what I'm arguing is, and we're arguing, is that if you have such big hardware installations, how can we build it so that it's viable that many people are involved in the evolution of how that machine is used? So that many people are involved in all layers of the software. And can we skinny the system down so that the primitives that are there are simple, small, hardware enforced and can open it up so that providers may very well be, you know, cloud providers and so on, may very well live on top of such a machine. It's not, it's not a one or the other. The question is, is there utility in such large systems that can be have public access because you now get to leverage what it means to have consolidated hardware. And all those things that you mentioned are absolutely values that we see of consolidated hardware. Cheaper, more power efficient, but we also believe more transparent if we choose to make them so. More open if we choose to make them so. Yep. Just to follow this question a little more specifically, I think there was an announcement from corporate IBM today that they're building five global data or hosting centers. It, could this be a substrate? Is this a candidate for a substrate for that kind of uh, commercial commuting, computing environment? Well, as a matter of fact, let me um, I think I have a slide here that's supposed to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've got going on. Let's see here. Sorry about that. Uh, there's yeah. Okay. We're, um, we're losing the feed, right? The external, external world got cut off right now, so this is the advantage of showing up. <laughs> so right now, this is very much an IBM research project. 
and, our cur and, and certainly our target is that exact kind of environment, is to be able to say, okay, look, this could be provisioned as a much more raw capacity that you can get access to. And currently to explore that, we've got one is that we're involved, sort of our day job, with providing a system uh, for major financial to use one of our internal systems uh, to be able to port one of their applications, because it's easy to do in our environment, like to leverage the size of BlueJean. Uh, but we're also looking at trying to integrate with exactly that kind of data center environment, but that's an internal use right now. Because again, there are questions about the changes we want to make to the hardware. Now ideally, I would say, yeah, absolutely, it's slated for year X. Uh, but I can't make that statement. But that is exactly what we would hope, is that we would be able to establish the utility of this kind of approach so that it's really viable and that we could imagine really extending the, the uses of those data centers. Can I get your... Uh... For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.